coming up tonight on VCU Insight. I'm Gabriella Lacombe, and I'll show you how some VCU students reacted to the Trump administration's decision to phase out DACA. I'm Bradford Ambers, and coming up, you'll hear from one local group that's ready to put up a fight to keep the Confederate monuments along Monument Avenue. I'm Amber Wishy, and I'll tell you about the first of 12 women's monuments coming to the Capitol in downtown Richmond. All this and more, VCU Insight starts right now. From the Richard T. Robertson School of Media and Culture at Virginia Commonwealth University, named best student newscast in the Mid-Atlantic, this is VCU Insight. Good evening and welcome to VCU Insight. I'm Alexis Allen. And I'm Gabrielle Randolph. Thanks for joining us. After the Trump administration moved to end DACA, otherwise known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, students met with VCU President Michael Rowell and other high-level administrators to demand protection for DACA res recipients. Directly after, those same students rallied on campus. Gabriella Lacombe has more. A day after the announcement, protesters gathered here in VCU Compass to show resistance to Trump's plan to phase out the program that allows illegal immigrants brought to this country as children to legally live and have access to public education in the United States. Members of the VCU Hispanic Student Activist Group Plumas led the crowd in protest chants and asked their peers to put pressure on public officials to help dreamers. We need VSA. We need NAACP. We need the Muslim Student Association. We need the Indian Student Association. We need all of these organizations to help us because this affects you too. Plumas members who went to President Rao's office said that he promised to collaborate with the VCU Police Department to prevent immigration status hunts and that he will work with other VCU administrators to develop a private fund dedicated to paying Dreamer student tuition if they lose their in-state benefits. President Trump said Congress has six months to find a replacement for the program, but with no current solution, Dreamers are worried about the threat of deportation and the future of their friends, their families, and themselves. You need to be listening and you need to, again, be putting your body first because at the end of the day the people around us the people here we shouldn't be having to risk ourselves to fight for our own fight we need to have people here to help us and support us because at the end of the day we need to have those voices for vcu insight i'm gabriella lacombe in an official statement released online on september 5th President Rao said that VCU will continue to advocate for DACA students within the legal bounds that govern us as a public university. There are 58 DACA students here at VCU. We have one of them here in the studio along with an immigration expert. Inside Sierra Brown is here in the studio to take a closer look at how these students could be affected. Thanks guys, I'm here with Jeanette Amato and Brittany Keegan. Jeanette is a DACA recipient and Brittany Keegan is a doctoral candidate at VCU's Wilder School. Thank you both for joining us. Thank yeah. you. So Brittany, can you tell me where we're at with the DACA situation right now? Yeah, so DACA has always been a contentious issue and recently 10 state attorney generals sent a letter to the Trump administration threatening legal action if essentially the program wasn't ended. So on September 5th, an announcement was made that the program would be terminated, but there were some caveats. So although the program is no longer accepting new applications, applications that had already been received would still be processed. Those who are up for renewal by March 5th of 2018 are still allowed to apply for that renewal as long as their applications for that are in by October 5th. So right now there's a lot of speculation about what's going to happen. We're just not sure. It's possible um, that there could be some kind of congressional action taken or maybe some legal action taken to either keep DACA or something similar. Okay, and Jeanette, can you tell me how you're directly affected by this situation? Um, yes, so unfortunately I don't fall into the category of the renewal because my DAC expires in October of 2018. So that means that I do not know where I stand um, academically and career-wise. And also one thing that I guess affects me the most is having the fear of deportation if there's not a resolution within the six-month period that they promise. Um, Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, Brittany, can you tell me what is the likelihood of a Republican Congress passing a legislation that will protect dreamers like Yannette? 
So one thing that DACA has going for it is that um, we have some moderate conservatives who are still in support of DACA because they recognize the economic benefits that DACA recipients can bring, and they also might see it as the morally correct thing to do. So we can see this going a couple different ways. It's possible that Congress will not take action and the program will end, although I don't think that's the most likely scenario. Um, one thing that could happen would be a similar piece of legislation could be passed. For example, there's something called the Bridge Act, which is a bipartisan proposed bill, and that stands for barring the removal of individuals who dream and grow the economy. This would um, provide DACA-like protections for three more years, and because that would be an act passed by Congress rather than executive action, it'd be more stable than DACA is right now. We could also see something almost like a legislative trade-off. So um, the more conservative Republicans who are not in favor of DACA might propose a piece of legislation that they would like to see passed and say something like, we'll support DACA if um, Democrats and the moderate conservatives will support their bill. So okay. there are many different options and we're just waiting to see what will happen. Okay, Jeanette, can you tell me, where were you born and do you live in fear of being deported? Yes, I was born in uh, Mexico and uh, I came to the USA when I was eight years old. So basically this is my home and I am. I, I think the fear, I don't think, um, I can't lie. I cannot lie about the fear that I have every day waking up knowing that each day is, is, is a time that is aspiring, time that I don't know where I will stand next year. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you both yeah. for joining us. Thank you. Back to you guys at the desk. A neo-Confederate group says it plans to hold a rally on September 16th at the Robert E. Lee Monument in Richmond. The CSA 2, the new Confederate States of America, is scheduled to have the event even though there is an executive order in place that temporarily prohibits rallies there. This comes on the heels of the Charlottesville City Council unanimously approving the removal of the Stonewall Jackson Monument on September 5th. But is there a legal battle brewing over the Confederate monuments in the River City? Bradford Ambrose is along Monument Avenue with more. Yeah, guys, this is an issue that's not likely to go away anytime soon. Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney created the Monument Avenue Commission for the city to take a look at whether they should keep the Confederate monuments along Monument Avenue. But I spoke to one pro statue group and they say they're ready to put up a fight. This issue of removing statues, taking tax dollars is a sham. Richmond City resident James S. Hames Jr. believes there are more important issues to worry about like the city schools. We have one of the oldest infrastructures as far as schools in this region. Barry Eisenhower with the Virginia Flaggers is against the removal of the Confederate statues on Monument Avenue. There are many groups that would sue and we are prepared to sue. Now it's worth noting the Robert E. Lee statue behind me is actually on state property, but the rest of the monuments along Monument Avenue are on city property. So whatever the city decides to do won't affect the Robert E. Lee statue. That's up for the state legislator to decide. The ACLU of Virginia released a statement saying they want the Confederate monuments removed from Monument Avenue. In a recent Mass Inc. polling group poll, 51% of Virginia voters believe the Confederate monuments on public property should stay. VCU is also taking a look at whether any Confederate symbols exist on either campuses. Dr. President Rao has asked his senior level officials to seek student and faculty input. We'll, of course, keep you updated. In Richmond, Bradford Ambrose, VCU Insight. There are four Confederate statues on city property along Monument Avenue. Jeb Stewart, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, and Matthew Mari. Lee Davis High School, home of the Confederates, in Hanover County is currently dealing with dueling petitions to keep or change the school's name and mascot. That, this comes after the recent white supremacist riots in Charlottesville. Jordan Howard has more. Lee Davis High School, home of the Confederates, named after Confederates Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, has flown its flag high with Confederate pride since 1959. However, the school is now facing controversy due to their name and Confederate mascot. Ryan Leach, Lee Davis class of 2010, is petitioning for a change. Leach says that the name and mascot contradicts Lee Davis High School's own mission to prepare students for success due to its racial connotation. Jared Cabanban, Lee Davis class of 2017, says that he supports a change. It's a new day and age. I think it's time for a change. 
but you have to view it from other people's perspectives. Nicole Jackson, Lee Davis alumna, is petitioning to keep the school's mascot. Jackson states that it's offensive that someone is trying to take that pride and make it into something dirty. Amy Booth, who works with Lee Davis Athletic Boosters and is a mother of four Lee Davis graduates, supports keeping the current name and mascot. People need to respect the history that, that, that the Confederates represent, that our rebels represent, that Lee Davis represents, all of it. I think they just need to respect it and appreciate the fact that when people, kn people knew what they were doing when they named the school that way. Though there's no word yet on whether Hanover County plans to change Lee Davis's name and mascot, in an official statement from Hanover County School Board Chair Mrs. Sue Dibble, she says that the goal continues to be to create a safe, welcoming, and inclusive environment for all students. For VCU Insight, I'm Jordan Howard. As of today, the petition to change the name and mascot has over 1,000 signatures, while the petition to keep the name and mascot has over three. As school begins this fall, some students are in for some big changes this school year. Over the summer, Prince George and Colonial High School systems followed Hanover to change its grading scale to a 10-point scale. According to the Prince George School's website, under the new scale, students will now receive an a for a grade from 97 to a 100. Prince George Guidance Counselor Philip Jones says that now they will be able to see which students will work hard to achieve an a Jones says when a child applies for college, the school will send information about their grade point scale so that a student is not overlooked because of their GPA. Go to Prince George and Colonial High School's website pages for more information. A monument to recognize over 400 years of women's achievements in the state of Virginia is on its way to Rich Richmond. Amber Wishy has more. Twelve Virginian women who played significant roles in the Commonwealth's history will be honored with a $3.4 million site outside the Capitol building in downtown Richmond. Voices from the Garden honors the unrecognized voices of women of various races with life-size bronze statues. According to the Virginia Women's Monument Commission, each woman played a vital role in improving Virginia. Executive Director of the Capitol Fund, Colleen Messick, said having role models is important. I hope and, and know that once we're able to illuminate these women's stories, that young women, girls, are going to be able to look up to role models and be able to uh, see the extent of what is possible. Adele Goodman Clark, a Richmond suffragist and artist, will be the first to go up at the site. Advocates for the site, including former first daughter Jenna Bush, gathered at St. Catherine's School in Richmond to support the monument. Sandra Hall, a St. Catherine's parent, said the monument is motivational. With the um, significance of that, um, it's a strong, strong um, push to make women not only in Richmond but all over to do what they um, set their mind out to do. This is exactly where the empowerment will be brought to life. The 12 figures, which include Maggie L. Walker, Virginia Estelle Randolph, and Martha Washington, will be placed here to honor their contributions to society. For VCU Insight, I'm Amber Wishy. The unveiling of the 12 figures is expected to take place in 2019. The names of other significant Virginia women will be placed throughout the site. Coming up, VCU sends help to victims of Hurricane Harvey. Plus, the VCU School of Engineering gets $25 million for medical research. We'll tell you what they plan to do with it next. We've never been very good at sitting still. Maybe that's why we built our campus in the middle of a city. Why we put our classrooms on riverbanks. In Fortune 500 companies, even on stage. At Virginia Commonwealth University, learning happens everywhere. What matters most is how you make it real. In an effort to help the city of Houston rebound, the VCU men's basketball program took donations from fans at the Richmond Diamond. For eight hours, the players and the coaches took turns unloading cars full of school supplies, food, and other items that could be of use to those affected by the worst hurricane in our, our country, 
has ever seen since Katrina. Head coach Mike Rhodes wants community service to be a cornerstone of the VCU basketball culture, and it showed as his team wouldn't allow a little rain to stop them from assisting those in need. Yes, we'll be doing a lot of community service. Um, that's one of our values here, which is appreciation. So appreciation goes with appreciating the, the time that you and especially you and the opportunity that you have and the platform that you have. So we want to take advantage of this platform to make sure that we're making a positive impact on the community as well. If you're interested in donating to those affected by Harvey, visit redcross.org. Richmond is ranked among the highest in the country for those living with HIV AIDS, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now there's a new hope for those living with the disease. Why? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation granted the VCU School of Engineering a $25 million grant to research low-cost treatments. According to Dr. Frank Gupton, head of research, they've had success in dropping the cost of the HIV AIDS treatment by 10% in less than a year. The AIDS Foundation seemed to be pretty satisfied with uh, what we've been able to accomplish with the funding that they've given us. So uh, they asked us if we could work on multiple drugs in parallel. Dr. Gupton also says that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wants to make VCU the hub for low-cost drug research. 44,000. That's how many Americans commit suicide each year, according to the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Over 1,000 of those deaths are reported here in Virginia. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the U.S., according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, with an average of 121 suicides per day. September is dedicated to bringing awareness to suicide and to help prevent it. VCU Counseling Services will be holding events throughout the month, including two meetings which provide training on how to help someone who may be having suicidal thoughts. According to Save.org, warning signs of suicide include extreme moods, showing rage, or talking about being a burden to others. Chris Clark is a 20-year-old suicide survivor who encourages anyone who is struggling to seek, to seek help. Probably tell them that there, there's always somebody that wants you around and that you need to go and talk to somebody even though it's probably one of the last things you feel like you should do. For more information about suicide prevention events that are happening on campus this month, visit, it, visit Counseling Services located upstairs in the Commons on the campus of VCU. Coming up, we sit down with the founder and director of the Independent Africana Film Festival. Plus, there's a new way to get around Richmond. We'll tell you how your smartphone puts the program right at your fingertips. RVA's art scene just got a little more cinematic. Black independent filmmakers are showcasing the black experience at this year's second annual Africana Film Festival. VCU Insight Sayonia Hoogley is in the studio with the founder of the festival. Sayonia. Thanks, Alexis. The film festival focuses on the global black narrative. The festival has several venues that include the Black History Museum and the Great Street Venue, Great Street Theater among several other venues in the area. 40 plus films are on view. I'm here with founder and creative director Afri of the Africana Independent Film Festival in Jolie Moon, who is based in here in Richmond. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. So what are the genres in the film festival? What can we expect, horror films, romance, romances, things of that nature? A little bit of everything. So we will have comedies, we'll have lots of dramas. Uh, we do have some experimental films. We do have some thrillers, no horror films just yet, but some thrillers uh, and then some documentaries. And they range from short films all the way to feature length. So you'll get a little bit of everything at the festival. Nice. So why bring a festival that specifically focuses on the black narrative and the black experience here to Richmond? Well, I think that it's important that as Richmond continues to grow and shift 
as a city, and especially as a city that celebrates the arts, that we make sure that the arts are fully represented and that various voices have a platform. So this, Africana is a way for me to make sure that the black narrative is celebrated, especially in a city that's 50% black and with the rich and interesting, we'll say, history that we have here. Nice. So we have several black independent film festivals that happen across the world. So what makes your film festival so unique? Well, I think the, I think the space that it happens in makes it unique. I think the fact that it's here in Richmond, the birthplace of the African American experience is something that makes us different than most any other city that festivals are offered in. People have an opportunity to, yes, get a glimpse of the contemporary uh, film narratives that are being presented, but then on that back, on the backdrop of it, we have this city that has such historical significance. And a lot of times what I found is that black people don't understand the historical significance for their own narrative that is tied to Richmond. So as a part of our festival for our filmmakers that come from out of town, we actually do a trolley ride and we take them to different historic spaces that are relevant to black Richmond. And they walk away with a different understanding and knowing that one in four black people in this country came through this city. Um, so we feel like Richmond makes it special. So what else can we expect to see aside from films? So we try to, we try to mix it up a little bit, you know. We are not necessarily a festival for the film purist. Uh, we want to be able to present high quality films that are engaging and interesting, but at the same time, we wanna create spaces for people to connect with one another. So one of the things that we do is we offer the opportunity for conversation after almost every screening. Mm -hmm. That's really important for us. We want people to be able to kind of digest that information, see what the person next to you was thinking, have an opportunity to meet with the filmmaker. So we feel like that's one thing that makes us special. But then we also offer cocktail parties, after parties, workshops. You know, we want to keep it lively and fun. We want people to move around, see the city. That's why we host at so many different venues. Um, so we feel like we try to layer it and add some texture so that it's not just film, it's a full experience. Nice. So with that in mind, what are you most excited for viewers to see? That's so hard. We have so many great films coming. Uh, I mean, of course, we have our John Coltrane documentary. That's a Richmond premiere uh, that's coming on Friday night. Talib Kweli will be there as a panelist. So that's going to be amazing. Plus his after party. We're screening an encore of Insecure with Amanda Seals. That's going to be I mean, totally crazy. Um, <laughs> then we're gonna have, uh, we have a Ghanaian American filmmaker, uh, Adoma Kosawa Wusu, who'll be joining us and her films are awesome. Plus Gabby Sibide, uh, also known as Precious. She uh, has a film, it's her directorial debut, and we will be having the Virginia premiere of that film. So we're really excited about that as well. Lots of amazing things going on over the entire span of the weekend. So we encourage people to check out the website. That's so awesome. So this is my last question. Since you're a Richmonder, were you, was this your way of putting Richmond on the map? Well, I wouldn't be as pretentious as to say that. But I think that uh, Africana is a drop in the bucket. I think lots of things are happening that is uh, putting Richmond at the forefront of a broader conversation, a national conversation. On some things on the positive side, some things not so much. But I think that Africana is a space where we are able to um, really celebrate what Richmond has to offer. Nice. Yeah. So that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining us. And check out the Africana Independent Film Festival happening here September 14th through the 17th. Right. Now back to the desk. According to the U.S. Census, Richmond ranks among the largest cities for commuter biking. And thanks to a new bike share program, biking around the city just got a little bit easier. Jordan Bress has more on the launch. Three, two, RVA Bike one, Share has officially two, launched and is providing tourists and residents a new way to travel around the city. According to their website, this program includes 20 stations and 220 bikes located in areas such as the Fan, VCU campus, Jackson Ward, and downtown Richmond. RVABikes.com says bikes can be rented out for $1.75 for a single ride, 
but monthly and yearly memberships that range from $18 to $96 are also available. According to the Richmond Magazine, Bowegian Technologies is the group that installed the bikes and will provide the first year of operations. It's really just another answer to the transportation picture that a lot of us have when we live in urban areas. According to the Richmond Times-Dispatch, the bikes will be maintained by Core Logistics, a veteran-run group from Baltimore that provides bike-sharing systems. CEO of Core Logistics, Jim Duffney, says that there are a few easy ways riders can unlock and rent out bikes. You can do it by your phone. The phone, on it, we have an app. You can unlock it with your key fob as a membership, and you can unlock it by going to a kiosk and getting a, a single trip card. Duffney also says that all of the bikes have special features to make sure that each rider has a comfortable and fun experience. Jim Duffney, CEO of Corpse Logistics, says that RVA bike share is not just about convenience, but is also about a healthier lifestyle. For VCU Insight, I'm Jordan Bruss. Chris King, Chris King says that come spring, RVA bike share is planning to double the amount of bikes and bike stations and is also looking to add ped leg cycles, which will help give riders a boost when climbing up steep hills. For more information, you can visit our website at rvabikes.com. And for all the dog lovers out there, find out where you can see smiling faces, wagging tails, and get a nice cold beer. Carly Ford is here. Sunny afternoons in Richmond mean a few things for Isley Brewing Company. Games, beer, and dogs on deck. Their back deck has become a friendly environment for dogs and their owners. Manager Tim Jones said it was the customers who wanted this to happen. We're just looking for that option, a place where they could go and drink a beer with their best friend who happens to be a, a dog. Isley Brewing Company advertises for dogs on deck through richmondevents.com. Customers have been bringing their furry friends along with them and Jones said that some have even become regulars. Always a draw. Uh, it's always a guarantee that you will have a good number of dogs out here. You know, the, the dogs' names maybe more than the, the owners' names at times. Jeff Grimes and his dog Thomas have become some of those regulars who come at least once every week. Grimes says that Thomas really enjoys the atmosphere. He likes other dogs. He likes people. People love him. Everywhere Thomas walked, he was greeted with friendly faces. You can tell by the wagging of his tail that he was enjoying his time just as everyone else was. They say a dog is a man's best friend, so what's a better way to spend your afternoon than with a brew and your favorite four-legged canine? I'm Carly Ford, VCU Insight. For more information, you can visit the Isley Brewing Company website at isleybrewingcompany.com or call them at 804-716-2132. And that does it for this edition of VCU Insight. Make sure to check out our website at insight.vcu.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under VCU Insight. Contact us with any stories you'd like to see on our show. And if you missed our show or would like to watch it again, you can find us on YouTube at VCU Insight. Thanks for watching. I'm Alexis Allen. And I'm Gabrielle Randolph. We'll see you next time.